Hi, everybody. Today we're going to talk about communication, one of my favorite topics. Here are your learning objectives for this chapter. Make sure to familiarize yourself with those and be able to speak to them in your own words at the end of this lecture. By the way, this chapter is full of wonderful boxes of information. And while you might think communication is bluff, it is not. Um, it is really and truly going to make or break how well you are able to form relationships with your patients and your colleagues in your patient care. So understanding this information and implementing different strategies is highly important to your career as a nurse or your career in anything that you choose to do. There are five parts to the communication process according to Berlow's theory. Uh, you have a stimulus, which is um, something that triggers you to communicate. And then you have the sender or the source of the message, the encoder, that begins the process. So the sender or the encoder um, transmits the message. The message itself is the communication product. And next you have the medium. How did you communicate? Um, was it verbally, so it was auditory? Was it visual, using hand gestures? Or was it kinesthetic through touch? And then your receiver or the decoder translates and interprets the message that they have received. And then you finish that loop of communication through confirmation of the message. You get um, feedback from the receiver that they have understood the message. There are many forms of communication. We have verbal, of course. And know that there are uh, things that will impede that verbal communication. So um, we need to make sure that our patient is able to, from a developmental standpoint, understand our message from an education level standpoint. So avoid using um, jargon, medical jargon. And just know we're going to have a ton of verbal interactions with our patients and families. We're going to collaborate with the healthcare team and developing care, our plan of care and evaluating our patients' progress. So it's important that we have good verbal communication skills. Nonverbal, however, is a huge part of our communication. So um, nurses have to learn to control facial expressions. Um, because our facial expression can negate what we just said verbally to our patient. So uh, that includes things like eye contact. So in many cases, we want to ensure we have great eye contact. If possible, sit down with your patient so you're at eye level with them. Uh, but you also, from a cultural perspective, want to know if your patient's culture avoids eye contact, either out of a sign of respect or Sometimes they feel it's confrontational or threatening to make eye contact. So most cultures, though, value eye contact, and it helps to convey uh, that you're listening and that you care about what they're saying. And then touch is a huge thing, too. Um, older people, especially those that don't have any family, studies show that they are just so um, needful of therapeutic touch. So know that and don't be afraid to um, hold their hand or, um, you know, put your hand on their arm. But be careful. I mean, you can kind of tell if you're really good at decoding body language if they're open to that. Sometimes they might not be. But I will just say that many older people long for touch, especially if they're isolated um, or if they're in the hospital or have been in long-term care for a long time. So uh, there's special classes you can take on therapeutic touch as well. It's a great way to um, build rapport with your patient. Ensure that you're aware of your posture and your gait and your gestures. If you do sit down with your patient, don't cross your arms or legs. Uh, stand facing your patient instead of standing uh, sideways to show that you're 
you're present and you're paying attention. You can also um, use posture gate, posture and gait to assess how is your patient doing? Are they slouched over or are they sitting up straight and alert? Are they walking with confidence or are they shuffling along and maybe they look like they're depressed? So we say a lot with our nonverbal. What does the general appearance look like? As nurses, we need to make sure that we are clean and neat in our appearance. Uh, we've showered, our hair looks well put together, you know, uh, we're clean. And we're also going to use those, we're going to assess our patients. How do they look? Have they showered recently? Um, does their skin appear dry? If so, what's their hydration status? So just general physical appearance tells us a lot. And then how are they dressed? How are they groomed? How are we dressed and groomed? Obviously, sounds tell us much. Sometimes if we said to someone, how are you feeling today? And they say, okay. But um, you can tell they've been crying or they just sighed heavily. Maybe that nonverbal just negated what they told you. So that is an opportunity for us to pick up on that cue and probe to ask them if there's more going on or if you could sit down and talk to them for a bit. Don't be afraid to use silence to give your patients time to um, think about what you've said or to reflect on what they want to share with you. It's okay to have silence. Don't feel the need to fill it all the time. And also don't be afraid to pause and think about what your reply is when your patient is asking you questions. We also have electronic communication, which are uh, we use a ton of because we are nurses. So we do a lot of charting, nurses' notes, um, communication, handoff, text messaging, all kinds of things. So we want to avoid using acronyms or um, like use complete words instead of shortening something because we want to make sure that our electronic communication is clear, concise, and that it is factual. We also need to make sure that it is secure. So whatever, wherever you're working, you'll have policies on your electronic communication. Many places will say that you're not able to send text message, text messages to the providers. Um, so be careful about about that. All right, let's see what's on the next slide. Communication technologies. So I just talked about electronic communication. Now I want to talk a little bit about social media. Let me get to my highlights that I made in the chapter about it. The biggest thing I want to say is that, well, if I can find it, sorry guys, where is it? The biggest thing I can say is I would be extremely careful what you share in social media. Darn it. Let me pause it while I look. Okay, social media. Know that describing a patient by using a room number or a diagnosis rather than a name is still considered a breach of confidentiality and a violation of, private, of patient privacy, so it's a HIPAA violation. Inappropriate use of social and electronic media may be reported to the nurse's state board of nursing. Reports of inappropriate disclosure by a nurse may be investigated on the grounds of unprofessional conduct, unethical conduct, moral turpitude, mismanagement of patient records, and or breach of confidentiality. This can result in a reprimand or a sanction a monetary fine or temporary or permanent loss of licensure. Um, you also, depending on how grievous the error was, um, have the potential for civil and criminal penalties, including monetary fines and possible incarceration. Employers may use social media to screen potential employees as long as they do not violate discrimination laws. So know that anything that you're posting on social media can be looked at and it probably will be. I don't know anybody anymore that doesn't look at, um, they don't look for people that are, they're thinking of hiring to see what they're doing on social media. 
So um, that is pretty much all I wanted to say about social media. I already talked about email and text messages. Really, I didn't say anything about email, but it's the same applies. You need to use clear, concise, avoid jargon, avoid abbreviations, um, avoid, make sure they're sent in a secure um, format, not emails that somebody could potentially hack and read. So it should be encoded. Then you have um, healthcare and telemedicine, which has become a huge thing since COVID. That was one of the only good things I feel like that came out of COVID. So um, if you end up being a nurse that works with telehealth and telemedicine, it's important to understand that you still have communication and it almost makes it sometimes more difficult to convey um, that you're listening and that you're understanding. So make sure that you dress professionally, decrease distractors like environmental noise or clutter around you, ensure privacy and lack of interruptions, and make use of key nonverbal cues like leaning in or nodding, making eye contact to communicate interest, empathy, and engagement with the patient or the professional that you're talking with. Being a good listener is essential. It's always essential. It's probably one of the hugest factors in communication. If you don't listen to understand and instead you're listening so you can make a reply, that will impede your communication and your rapport with your patients and your profession, interprofessional communications. Oh, here we go. There's some more information on electronic communication and emails. There are four different levels of communication. The first of which is intrapersonal. And I know I've talked to some of you about, watch how you talk to yourself. We should be our own best friend. Think about what your best friend would be saying to you. They would be encouraging you. So be your own best friend and be positive. So if you're walking into a situation where you've never been in this situation and you have to do something for the first time, tell yourself, I have got this. Um, Stand up for yourself and ask someone to come with you if you need to. Ask your instructor to. Um, ask another student to come with you. But talk to yourself that you've got this and that you know what to do. Don't say, I've never done this. I'm totally going to screw this up and my instructor is going to be so mad at me. Don't do that self-fulfilling prophecy talk. Be your own best friend. Then your interpersonal communication is between two or more people with a goal to exchange messages. So you're hanging out with your friend, um, having lunch. That's interpersonal communication, just the two of you talking, catching up. A group is a small group. Um, let's see, there's a little bit of a difference in the, in the um, definitions. So a small group could be a staff meeting, a patient care conference, teaching sessions or support groups. Um, organizational communication could be like you're on a committee and you're revamping policies and procedures. Group dynamics are huge. I was a team leader and a manager before I became a nurse. And it really, um, a good group can make or break the outcome of what you're working on or what you're trying to um, accomplish. So, uh, group dynamics depends heavily on your members' behavior and their communication with each other. And effective groups are mutually respectful of each other. And it's up to the leader or the facilitator of that group to ensure that that is what's happening. If you have someone who is dominating, then you need to have a conversation with that person so that effective group work can um, take place. There's a table in your book that has characteristics of effective and ineffective groups. Look that over and see what you gain from that. Actually, look at all the tables in this chapter. All of them are pretty amazing, really. So here's some characteristics of effective and ineffective groups. That table I referred to breaks all of these down. So I'm not going to talk more about that. Um, I feel like you can look at that table. 
so please do. Factors that influence communication. I talked relatively briefly earlier in the chapter about knowing your patient's developmental level. And we've talked about developmental level um, as it pertains to um, Erickson's model. So we are concerning ourselves with the middle to older aged adult. So what are some developmental concerns that you might have that would influence communication? And that applies throughout life. Uh, gender can influence communication, sociocultural differences. So I brought up how some cultures may, um, may value eye contact, whereas others might not. Some cultures have a difference in what they consider personal space. So, for example, I believe the Latin cultures tend to be very, they'll stand very close to you and you might feel like your space is invaded if you're used to having like six feet of personal space. So theirs is less than three feet. So just know that those cultural differences exist. And over on the side there, you have the little human. So zero to 18 inches is considered intimate. Personal zone is 18 inches to four feet. Social zone, four to 12, and then public zone. Uh, roles and responsibilities. So if you are in an, a position of authority, but you are in a healthcare role, know that um, sometimes people will be intimidated by that and we want to put people at ease so we can build trust. Um, people's physical, mental, and emotional state make a huge difference in how we are able to convey a message. So if someone is in pain or they have just received horrible news um, or if they're in the, mental of a, in the middle of a manic state, we are not going to be able to communicate with them as effectively um, if we don't address what is happening. And perhaps we address what's happening and come back and have a meaningful conversation later if it's not a good time. Uh, values can influence communication and absolutely environment can influence communication. So I want to say if you're in a patient's room, it is appropriate to ask if you can turn off the television or mute the television, turn down the music, um, ensure privacy. So if you have a room full of family members, ask that patient if it's okay to speak in front of them. Um, if the environment is full of noise, smells, uh, bad lighting, all of those things can affect the ability of the receiver to interpret or even hear the message. We've talked about SBAR before. SBAR is something that the U.S. Navy, I believe, used to convey information to ensure that nothing was left out. And I believe you know that SBAR stands for Situation background assessment and recommendations. We started using this when Jaco um, wanted us to address and eliminate breakdowns in communication and the potential adverse effects that happen because of those. So they included a goal to improve the effectiveness of communication among caregivers. So implementing a standardized communication tool has shown to reduce the risk of transmitting inaccurate and incomplete information. So using an SBAR form when communicating amongst the healthcare team and doing so when you can and as much as you can in front of your patient. Okay, I'm back. I had to pause it for a moment. We're going to go to the next slide. I believe we have said enough about um, SBAR. All right, the therapeutic relationship. Know that the therapeutic relationship is something you're going to want to understand fully. A therapeutic relationship exists among people who provide and receive assistance in meeting human needs. And it sets the climate for the participants to move toward common goals. So 
One example of a therapeutic relationship, of course, is the nurse-patient relationship. The nurse is the carer and the patient is the person being cared for. So we need to set up this relationship in the context of mutual respect and value. That relationship is focused on promoting or restoring the health and well-being of the patient. The quality of the relationship between these people is the most significant element in determining its effectiveness. So, um, the most common failure in this type of relationship is the failure to establish rapport and a helping trust relationship with the other person. It is a professional relationship. So there's a sense of professionalism or confidence and the nurse needs to portray that confidence and expertise in their practice. If you do that, your patient is more likely to trust and value you and your co-workers. Uh, so be confident and confident and focus on your patients. Avoid sloppiness, inattention, uh, inappropriate behavior, or other breaches of professionalism because it undermines professionals, professional image of nurses and the effectiveness of our individual nurses. Characteristics of this therapeutic nurse-patient relationship include a caring person-centered relationship. It's dynamic. Both of the people provide, providing the, the assistance and the person being helped are active participants to the extent that each one is able. It's purposeful and time limited. So you have, you get together, you get to know what's going on, you help set goals, you use the nursing process. Those goals might shift and change over time, um, but it is time limited. So um, the person providing the assistance is professionally accountable for the outcomes of the relationship and the means used to attain them. Be sure that you are honest as you possibly can be and do not promise to provide more assistance than you can offer. All right. Characteristics, did I already talk about that? I believe I did. I guess I need to ensure that I'm forwarding my slides. I'm looking at the textbook at the same time. So the phases of the helping relationship. First, you have the orientation phase. This is where the roles of both people, so your nurse patient, are the roles are clarified. Um, the patient will, there's a box in your book it's called Summary of Patient Goals for the Three Phases of the Therapeutic Nurse-Patient Relationship. I would know that box. I could probably leave it there, but I'll go over it a little bit. Um, you come to an agreement. The patient will accurately describe the roles of the participants in the relationship. So the participants are, perhaps it's more than just you. Maybe it's physical therapy, you, uh, speech, and the healthcare provider and the patient. But let's keep it simple. It's you and your patient as the nurse. The patient and nurse will establish an agreement. So your agreement is after you have gathered your data, um, come to mutual uh, understanding of the issues for your patient. You have goals about the relationship. Where are we going to meet? How often will we meet? And how long will we meet? And then the duration. So that's the orientation phase. It's kind of setting the stage. My name's Marcel. I'm going to be your uh, home health nurse, and I'm here to assist you in learning more about how to manage your left-sided heart failure. So I will be here weekly. Uh, what time works for you? That kind of thing. That's your orientation phase. The working phase, the patient is actively participating in the relationship. They are cooperating in activities that work toward achieving mutually acceptable goals. So again, we as the nurse do not define the goals. We work together with the patient dynamically to 
identify the goals. The patient will express feelings and concerns to the nurse. And then the termination phase, the patient will identify the goals were accomplished or that they made progress towards their goals and they'll verbalize feelings about the termination of the relationship. All right, let's go to that next slide. And pretty much what I just said was that table. Oh, there's the goals of the orientation phase, which is what I said. There's the goals of the working phase and the goals of the termination phase. That was quick. Dispositional traits. Uh, what factors promote effective communication? Your behavior or dispositional traits will affect this. This includes how you come across to the patient. Are you warm, friendly, and approachable? Can patients feel comfortable expressing themselves? And do they feel that they are respected for who they are? Does the nurse identify with what the patient is going through but not pity them, instead empathize with them? So I want to talk about the difference between empathy and sympathy there. Empathy is an objective understanding of the way in which the patient sees their situation. You identify with the way the other person feels, putting yourself in another circumstances, imagining what it would be like to share that person's feelings and communicating this understanding to the patient. So. The patient tells you a whole long story and then you can reciprocate back to them or that's not the word I want. You can reflect back to them. What I think I'm hearing you say is that you're really having a hard time and you're feeling so sad over the loss of your dog that you've had for the last 15 years. So you are reflecting back to them. You're putting yourself in their circumstances and repeating back in a caring manner that you understand. In contrast, sympathy is the expression of sorrow for someone's situation. Um, it does involve compassion and kindness. However, sympathy shifts the emphasis, emphasis from the patient to the nurse because the nurse is sharing their feelings and personal concerns and projects those onto the patient. An empathetic nurse is sensitive to the patient's feelings and problems, but remains objective enough to help the patient work to attain positive outcomes. So here are some other examples. This must be a hard time for you. How are you coping? Um, is there any way that I can be of help? When the patient and family sense that you have some idea of what they're experiencing and that you are committed to helping, the basis is set for a trusting nurse-patient relationship. So that is what I want you to know. Uh, the rest of these traits on here, let me see if there's anything else I wanna mention. If you say you're gonna be back to check on them in a half hour to an hour, please make sure you do that because if you do not, uh, then you break your word and that is all you have sometimes. If you don't know an answer to a patient question, don't make something up. Tell them you don't know, but you will find out. Do you convey caring about them and their situation? Do you present yourself as being competent and knowledgeable? Make sure you're aware of how you're coming across. It's okay to say you don't know. None of us know everything, trust me. No one does. We're constantly learning in this profession. You must also establish and build a rapport with your patient. Every encounter with your patient should be a purpose and, the, and it should have an objective, and that needs to be shared with your patient. You need to make sure your patient is comfortable and in a comfortable environment. People in pain or suffering may not be open to your communication. Plus, we must be cognizant of patients' privacy when delivering messages. Um, you know, if we're, if we're in the emergency room and all we have is a little curtain around us, your patient might not be as willing to share with you private information that is sensitive. Uh, we must remind our patients that our conversations with them are private 
and only needs to know information would be passed on to people directly needing to know that information to care for them. <clears throat> we never draw attention to ourselves, ever. It is all about the patient and their needs. You need to pay attention to what is going on with the patient through nonverbal gestures, listening, and demonstrating interest in what is going on with them. Make sure you pace your communication at a level in which the patient can keep up and actively understand and have time to ask questions. There are several, I can't talk, there are several skills to conversation. Intonation is the tone of your voice. That includes pitch and volume. When I was a child, I knew when my mother was pleased with me or when I was in trouble just by the tone of her voice. That might bring back some memories for some of you also. You need to be knowledgeable about the topic of conversation and know the resources to tap into if you need to research a topic more. You have to be flexible in nursing. I feel like we say that all the time. You usually will hear us say, oh, we're going with plan B. You always have to have your plan B. If the patient wants to discuss something you had not intended to talk about, you have to be willing to let them talk about it. Stay on one subject at a time so you don't confuse the patient or make them think that what they're saying or what they want to talk about is not important. Make simple statements in layman's terms. Avoid words that have different interpretations, such as um, help. If you say the word help, it can have different interpretations. Um, denotation is the dictionary meaning of a word, and connotation is the implied or emotional meaning of the word. For example, the word baby is used in different situations and can have totally different meanings. Um, be truthful. If something is going to be painful, tell them that what they will experience ahead of time. Um, and don't use cliches. I don't know if that's going to be in here somewhere, but seriously avoid those. And do not give them false reassurance. Keep an open mind and take advantage of all good times to communicate with your patient. Good listening skills are imperative to the nurse. We need to understand our patients and their needs, and we need to evaluate if something needs to be addressed immediately. So. Um, be aware of your body language. Look directly at your patient. Get at their eye level. Sit down if you can. Um, remember the eye, contract, eye contact if it is culturally appropriate. Lean in or forward. Keep your arms relaxed. Don't cross your legs. Be alert and engaged. Keep the conversation natural. Use gestures like head nodding to show you are understanding what they are telling you. Take the time to think through your responses. Don't already be thinking what you're going to say when the patient is still talking to you. I said that earlier. Listen to understand, not to respond. Never pretend to be listening. People can tell when you're not. List uh, four themes or topics the patient is covering and what may be missing. So keep a list. There's nothing wrong with a bit of silence, or if you feel it calls for it, some therapeutic touch for reassurance. Therapeutic touch is very important to nursing. It conveys caring, concern, or encouragement. But be careful of using touch with people who are angry or confused, as this may be misinterpreted as something threatening. And I can't say that enough. Be careful if they're confused. Definitely if they're angry. The interview is an important process of obtaining accurate information and collecting accurate data. There are a few things you need to know about how to do a good interview. This slide, if you don't know what all these terms are, you kind of need to know these terms. So make sure that you understand um, assertiveness versus aggressiveness, open-ended questions versus closed-ended questions. What are validating questions? What are clarifying? What's a reflective question? Um, what are sequencing? So 
understand all those terms. Active listening involves giving your full attention to the person speaking and not thinking ahead of a response and not interrupting them. Face your patients, make eye contact, and focus on only the conversation at hand. Provide a comfortable, private environment to enhance the active listening experience. Trust will allow your patients to disclose information that may be very valuable for their care. Use open-ended questions that will elicit more information. So, um, open-ended questions. Tell me more about what the doctor said to you in your appointment yesterday. That's open-ended. Instead of, what medication did the doctor prescribe yesterday? That's closed-ended. Um, assertiveness and confidence helps to um, show that you know what you're talking about and that you're there to assist them and help them. It allows you to deal directly with issues if there are any issues. Um, restating in your own words to allow the patient to acknowledge that you received the message correctly is your reflective questions or comments. So you listen to what they said, repeat it in your own words, and then ask if you understood that correctly. There are good examples of this in the textbook. Clarifying allows us to make sure we receive the message correctly, which is what I was just saying. Always do this if there is a doubt. So let's say that your patient said something and you didn't hear one of the words or maybe it just they said something and it could have had a different meaning. So clarify. Um, is this what you just said? Can you just clarify that for me? I might have missed something there. And then validating a message allows us to make sure we interpreted the meaning of a message correctly. Share any observations with your patient. This can be as simple as you seem very quiet and sullen today. Is there anything you would like to talk about? Silence can be a powerful tool. It conveys acceptance of the message and it allows the patient to continue discussing the matter at hand. Especially when teaching a patient about something, make sure to summarize your conversation at the end so that they know and you know that the teaching has been effective and conveyed the right message. What I want to say about that is, it says make sure you summarize your conversation, but again, remember the best way to know if the message was received is either to have the patient teach back something or have them summarize, and then you can um, correct anything along the way or at the end. So, and be careful how you word that. Okay, we've gone over a lot of information today and I just want to make sure that what I said um, was helpful to you. Can you just summarize for me so I ensure that you got it and then we'll get back together next week? Then they can tell you. And, and you're putting it on you. So it's, you know, it's your responsibility to make sure they learn. So can they summarize for you? And tell them up front you're going to ask them to do a little bit summarize too so that they're not thrown by that. This slide reviews the components of assertiveness in nursing. Learning to be assertive is a key aspect of being a successful, good communicator. And really and truly, sometimes it makes a huge difference in your patient's outcomes. Take a moment to review these components on the slide. By using I statements, you are owning the conversation and not placing the burden or direction on the other person. Also, the book has some great examples of the difference between assertive, aggressive, and non-assertive phrases. Make sure to take a look at them. So, um, here's an example. Uh, you have a nurse that you work with that is always taking long lunches. Like they're supposed to be gone 30 minutes and they're gone an hour. And it's really cutting into your time with your patients because you're taking care of theirs. So when they come back, you can say, um, I understand that sometimes it's easy to lose track of time, but I really need you to make sure that you try to be back from your lunch within 30 minutes because I'm having a difficult time taking care of all the patient's needs. That is owning it, it's I, I, I. Instead of, hey, you're never on time. That's so annoying and you're killing me, man. Uh, there's a total different message there. So own the uh, communication, but make sure that you are professionally addressing it and saying I statements. Aggressive behavior. Um, there is no room in nursing for aggressive behavior. 
it will be viewed negatively by your patients and your coworkers, and you will find that it will alienate many people. So don't be that nurse. Um, that's our bullying behaviors. So if you're angry, really, really watch your tone. And maybe you just need to go close the room in the break room and take some deep breaths. It can inhibit the formation of good relationships and collaboration. And it's, it's hard to fix it once you have broken that trust in that relationship. So, um, instead of accusing, look for ways that you can, that you can, um, collaborate. Uh, blocks to communication. There's a great example in your book of nursing students who go into the ICU and the patient is hooked up to a bunch of different machines and they are, uh, intubated, I believe. And they go in and have this whole conversation about the machines and the smells and how the patient looks and they never once talk to the patient. So remember that you're not treating the machines. You're not treating the technology. You're treating the patient as a human being. Uh, big blocks of communication, failure to listen. Again, listen to understand, not to reply. Asking too many questions. Um, try using open-ended questions. Because if you do that, you'll need to ask fewer questions. Non-therapeutic comments and questions. So can you think of, uh, I'll tell you some. Um, let me think about it for a second. Non-therapeutic. How about, this one's a good one. You aren't going to smoke that cigarette, are you? That's non-therapeutic. It's also leading. Or, um, everything will be all right. That's false reassurance. That's not therapeutic. Uh, and let's see, let me find another one. Oh, wow. Do not. And I know some of you do. It's a habit you need to break. Don't refer to your patients as honey or sweetie. Also, um, do not talk to your patients like they're babies. That is disrespectful and it's a form of ageism. So when you go in to talk to your patients, use your normal speaking voice. Um, be calm. Don't offer personal advice unless you're asked for it. That applies in any relationship, I feel like. And avoid using questions that contain the words why and how, because they can be taken as um, judgmental. So don't start your questions with why and how. The whole book gives several examples of all of these. And you need to understand and recognize because all throughout nursing school and even into the NCLEX, there's a lot of questions that you have to pick the most appropriate response. And if you choose one that says, why couldn't you sleep over? Tell me more about um, your sleep pattern. Then you've, you've not learned that. So no whys in house. Stereotyping or talking down to your patients, which I already talked on that. Avoid that ageism. Uh, not just ageism, though. Don't stereotype or assume your patients will behave or respond to treatments based on race, culture, religion, gender, or age. Every person's experience is individualized. And don't talk down to your patients, or you, I already said this, don't use the words honey or sweetie. They are not two years old. It's offensive and it's not appreciated disruptive interpersonal behavior. Um, I think this slide is pretty self-explanatory just looking at it. Bullying or incivility can be a problem in the workplace. And I'm just going to say that um, sadly, many of you will, will see that. It is considered lateral violence. Nurse-to-nurse -nurse hostility is called horizontal violence or bullying. 
This includes psychological or social harassment, withholding important information, gossiping, starting rumors, humiliating comments, eye rolling, and other gestures would all be considered forms of bullying. Bullying affects teamwork, patient outcomes, and can actually make a person feel sick. Don't let yourself become a victim of this. Be proactive in recognizing it and working towards education on the subject and changing the behaviors and culture of the workplace. Uh, I will also say document it. Um, bring it to your superiors. Um, many places have policies, and if they don't, they should, against that lateral violence and the bullying. Unfortunately, negative communication with physicians is still a problem. It is almost inevitable that you're going to come across a physician who will, um, as we used to say, ripped me a good one, and they usually like to do it in front of your peers or patients. You need to respond to this behavior immediately with the physician in a private setting, document the occurrence, and report it to your nurse manager. And unfortunately, a lot of the stuff that I just shared about nurse to nurse, um, I had all these happen to me when I was a new nurse. And um, I brought it to my manager's attention and documented it too. It was not acceptable. So some recommend recommendations to stop or prevent disruptive behaviors in the organization is education, being held accountable for the behavior, enforcing a zero tolerance policy, and have surveillance and reporting policies and procedures. Horizontal violence, or also known as lateral violence or workplace bullying, is described as non-physical, hostile, aggressive, and harmful behavior towards a coworker or group via attitudes, actions, words, and or behaviors. And it's characterized by behaviors such as making snide, belittling, or sarcastic comments. Incivility is defined as low intensity deviant behavior with the ambiguous intent to damage the target, breaking the norm of mutual respect in the workplace. Uncivil behaviors are rude and discourteous, revealing the lack of respect toward the others. The American Nurses Association define, uh, defines bullying as repeated, unwanted, harmful actions intended to humiliate, offend, and cause distress to the recipient. Uh, the dictionary's definition of mistreatment or abuse of someone vulnerable by someone more powerful. Incivility, bullying, and violence in the workplace are serious issues in nursing, with incivility and bullying widespread in all settings. Incivility is one or more rude, discourteous, or disrespectful actions that may or may not have a negative intent behind them. All right, uh, verbally and physically aggressive patients. You're gonna have that too, sadly. Um, so these, these acts include physical assaults and threats of assault directed toward persons at work on duty. Verbal harassment, threatening, yelling, bullying, hostile sarcasm. Nurses should respond by maintaining a professional demeanor, respond assertively, address the issue directly with those involved, seek guidance and support through the nurse managers or other appropriate channels. Impaired communication. That can affect every part of a person's life. It's essential to know how to work with patients who are visually and or hearing impaired, patients who are cognitively impaired, unconscious patients, and patients who do not speak English, as these will be patients you will encounter often in your nursing career. For a visually impaired patient, always announce your presence when you come into the room and make sure you use a normal tone of voice and tell them before you're going to touch them. For a hearing impaired patient, you want to make sure to get in their line of vision when coming into the room and before touching them. Talk directly and distinctly to them in their line of sight. Remember to mute the TV as well. Um, many have learned to adapt and read lips that have hearing impairments. Use gestures and if necessary, write things down. With patients who are cognitively impaired, you want to maintain eye contact to keep their attention and be in a place with minimal distractions. Remember, your distractions aren't just environmental. They can be pain or um, smells, that kind of thing. Keep all communications simple and to the point and in small doses. 
avoid open-ended questions and give them time to answer. For patients who are unconscious, I'm going to give you an example. Avoid saying, what would you like to wear today? Or what do you want for breakfast? And say, would you rather have oatmeal or toast? Would you rather have the brown pants or the gray pants? So it gives them a short, they only have to come up with black, you know, black or brown pants. I want oatmeal. For patients who are unconscious, you want to be mindful of what is said in the room, as they are most likely still able to hear you. And you should just assume that everyone can hear everything you say. Talk to them in a normal voice and tell them everything that you're going to do prior to doing it. Keep the environment quiet and peaceful if possible. And then for patients with English as a second language, you always want to use an interpreter. Speak in simple terms and use demonstration when you can. All right, guys, that's the end of this communication chapter.